Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. For weeks, the world has watched in horror while Russian troops invaded Ukraine, destroying neighborhoods, killing civilians, and sending millions of Ukrainians fleeing for their lives. Vladimir Putin's long-threatened effort to make Ukraine once again a part of Russia has made him an international pariah and unleashed a plethora of harsh sanctions on his country. So why do it? Here to answer that question is Bridget O'Keefe, a professor of history at Brooklyn College and a specialist on the history of the Soviet Union. Her new book, The Multi-Ethnic Soviet Union and Its Demise, is soon to be published as part of Bloomsbury's Russian Shorts book series. Welcome. So help me understand why Vladimir Putin launched this war on Ukraine. I'd be happy to try and make some sense of this, it's seemingly so senseless. But I'd actually begin in 2005. The story doesn't begin there. But in 2005, Vladimir Putin made a statement that caught a lot of attention in the West. He said in 2005 that the collapse of the Soviet Union was, quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. In Western ears, that rang false and strange and confusing, and it's caused a great deal of confusion ever since. But if you understand the world, in the way that Vladimir Putin understands the world. The Soviet Union's demise in 1991 was in an extraordinary historical wrong that he has been determined ever since to set right. What he meant by the demise of the Soviet Union being a great geopolitical catastrophe was that Russia, this historically great state, right, that in the 20th century, had countered uh, the power of the West and the capitalist West in particular, the United States, as a global power in a bipolar world. It had lost its standing on the world stage. It had lost its power. It had lost its voice. It had lost its greatness. And it had been, in his mind, plundered. He has spoken repeatedly in the years since um, to the aftermath of the Soviet Union's demise as a time in which portions of the former Russian state have been robbed from Russia, right? And that it's his job, it's his, in fact, messianic mission to regather these lost, what he calls Russian lands, and to reconstitute a strong, great, glorious, eternal Russia that can serve and that will be recognized as an uncontested counterweight to a West that he regards as hypocritical, malevolent, malign, and um, desperate to strangle Russia's capacity for greatness and geopolitical strength. It sounds a lot like what Adolf Hitler was saying uh, as his justification for starting World War II. Yeah, you know, I think that when we think about recent history and we think about 20th century history in particular, and particularly these extraordinarily calamitous wars, right? We think about World War II, we think about Russia's current war against Ukraine. I think that we should not underestimate the power of humiliation to help drive authoritarian regimes. Um, both Hitler and Putin, though they had very kind of different ideological motivations in their pursuit of larger empires, what they shared fundamentally was a kind of perspective and uh, a motivation that derived from an abiding sense and an abiding source of what they felt keenly as a historical humiliation. In Putin's sense, right, I would return us again to the quote that I began with, right, the idea that 1991 and the demise of the Soviet Union represented the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. The demise of the Soviet Union in 1991 was for Putin, but also for so many people of the former Soviet Union who experienced it. It was not just a geopolitical catastrophe, it was an economic catastrophe, it was a societal catastrophe, it was a political catastrophe, but it was also a per personal catastrophe. The 1990s that followed the demise of the Soviet Union was experienced by ordinary people all over Eurasia as a time of uncertainty, of instability, largely of economic deprivation, of a searching for a kind of new organizing idea and a search for stability. But it was also about a sense of feeling that Russia, right, for Russians particularly, that Russia had somehow lost its way, it had lost its standing in the world, and that it had been actively humiliated and denigrated by the self-declared winners of the Cold War, and in particular, the United States, which Putin 
um, these days refers explicitly to as an empire of lies. So Putin has described Russians and Ukrainians as one people, a single whole. But do the Ukrainians feel that way? Mm -hmm. This is an essential question for understanding all of this. And what I would first say is that for an authoritarian like Putin, for so many authoritarian leaders, history only exists and history only serves them as something that they can lie about, something that they can manipulate, something that they can falsify in order to serve their larger imperialist and national agendas. And that's what we've seen Putin doing very aggressively for nearly two decades, but even more aggressively since 2014. But I would highlight in particular um, an essay that Putin published and that was posted on the Kremlin website, translated in multiple languages, this past summer in July of 2021. He uh, wrote an essay that he titled On the Historical Unity of Russia and Ukraine. And what he did in that essay was he cherry picked, right? He picked moments here and there, right? And tried to assemble it in what was, he was presenting as a kind of unassailable narrative of how and why Ukrainians and Russians, and also Belarusians, have been united inescapably, eternally, in what he would call kind of a tripartite nation, a, a trinity of sorts of Slavic peoples united under the Russian people's lead. There are so many, there are so many hyster historical errors and falsehoods in this essay I can't even begin, but what I would also say is utterly terrifying about this essay is that Putin denies the reality that it is not just big men like himself who make history. He wants to deny the reality that ordinary people make history, that ordinary people have historical agency. We saw this in his essay, but we're also seeing it in this war. And what I mean by that is this, ordinary Ukrainian people chose independent sovereign nationhood. They chose it in 1991. On December 1st, 1991, the Ukrainian electorate voted in a referendum. Do we want to affirm a Ukrainian declaration of independence or not? 92.3% of the Ukrainian electorate chose independence. And since, in the 30 years since, Ukrainian people in banal ways, in ordinary ways, and in recent weeks, in absolutely extraordinary ways, have been demonstrated time and time again that they are invested, they are committed, they think of themselves as Ukrainians. They understand themselves as Ukrainians with a separate purpose, a separate culture. They have a shared past with Russia. There's no doubt about that. But the past is not destiny, right? Ordinary people, right? If we believe this, if we believe this, we are entitled to this. We should also believe that ordinary people in Ukraine are entitled to this as well. We choose our present, we choose our future. Since 1991, it's been a rocky path. Ukrainians have chose independence and Putin cannot tolerate it. And well, how do ordinary Russian people think about this war? I mean, or do they even know about it, that yeah. the war is going on? Yeah, this is a really important question too. It's hard to know what ordinary people think in an in authoritarian regime, right? And over the past five weeks especially, the last remaining vestiges of kind of independent media in Russia have been shut down, right? Um, forcibly or else by intimidation, right? And what we're left with are so-called opinion polls that Putin's own government is doing, right, to kind of gauge the feelings of ordinary Russians. And even just this past week, I saw one ostensible poll that showed, you know, some 86% of ordinary Russians surveyed said that they support Putin's war in Ukraine. We can't know, right? But we can know a few things. For 20 years, Putin has aggressively pursued authoritarian rule. He has fed the Russian people via the majority of state media channels a steady diet of propaganda, right? He has fed the Russian people his worldview, his framework, 
his falsified vision of history. That basically says, we've been robbed. We've been robbed, we've been plundered. We've been robbed, we've been plundered. And he's also been telling ordinary Russian people that Ukraine is not a country of ordinary people like you and me trying to go about their affairs and live their lives, but that Ukraine is a country that has been taken over by what he calls drug-addled neo-Nazis, right? And that we need to save, right, our fellow Slavic brothers who, uh, who have been uh, left to the devices of their own um, corrupt government that is a puppet state, he'll say, of the West that is trying to destroy all of us. If you remember that there is an older generation of Russians who do share some of the same mentality as Putin and who do share that same sense of loss, that shared memory of humiliation, it should not surprise us that some people in Russia would support this war, that they would embrace Putin's mission to reassert Russian greatness, to reassemble what Putin calls the Russian lands. But it's also hard to know to the degree to which Russians right now are mortified and embarrassed and horrified by what they're seeing. We should remember many Russian people have friends, relatives, grandparents, cousins, who are either in Ukraine trying to defend it or who have fled Ukraine for safety as refugees elsewhere in Europe. The Soviet Union once was a house, right? It was a, a country that united peoples of all different types of ethnicities. There was ethnic intermarriage, there was um, a single civic body, and when the Soviet Union collapsed, borders, borders were drawn into the map and families did become separated by those borders. So one of the things that has been so painful, I think, for many people is that they can call a relative, they can call a loved one in Moscow and say, do you know what your country is doing to our city? Do you know that your country has bombed our apartment building or our maternity hospital? And what they get in response over the telephone is, Ukraine deserves it. Putin's doing the right thing. But even here, do we know whether or not they mean it? There's a great deal of reason, if you're an ordinary Russian person, to be fearful of a regime that has made it abundantly clear that dissent will not be tolerated, that even going onto the streets of Moscow with a kind of cheeky sign that has asterisks instead of words, but that's meant to represent no to war, will land you, right, with uh, uh, police clubs against your head and a trip to the police station and a hefty fine and the potential for 15 years in jail. One of the new laws that Putin has passed just in recent weeks so you also can't even use the word war. That's exa exactly right. You, it, uh, Putin has made it illegal to speak of this war as a war, right? Russians, whether they're journalists or whether they're ordinary people, are instructed under the penalty of law that this can only be talked about as a special military operation. Dissent of any type is absolutely not tolerated, and it comes with hefty consequences. Ordinary people know this, so again, it's terribly difficult under the conditions of this type of authoritarian rule to know, do they mean it? Do they really believe it? Yeah. Um, so this is one of the things that makes it hard. So the consequences of waging this war have been, you know, very dire. I mean, so far the U.S. government has sought to help uh, Ukraine by providing material aid. Uh, and by trying to strangle the Russian economy through economic sanctions, and the European Union has, uh, you know, followed suit. How effective have these sanctions been, do you think? And how are they affecting the Russian people? Mm -hmm. Well, first, right, there's the business of the oligarchs, right? And none of us should be cueing our little tiny violins for them, right? The oligarchs will be okay, right? They've lost a few billions, but they have plenty of money and they have plenty I'll of They'll be salted away in other countries. <laughs> yes. How they are hurt, right, is that they can no longer kind of move breezily through these cosmopolitan centers um, with ease. They can no longer serve on the board of trustees of flashy or uh, respectable Western institutions. Um, but for the ordinary people, these sanctions have serious and dire consequences, some of which we won't even begin to see in their fullest extent for some time now. But what we've seen in a rather rapid amount of time is the literal landscape of contemporary Russia has been extraordinarily changed, right, almost in the blink of an eye, right? Ordinary Russians over the past 20 to 30 years have become entirely accustomed to shopping in Western stores that have 
establish themselves on Russian territory, to buying Western products, to traveling freely throughout the world on vacations. And they understand themselves prior to this as being integrated into a wider world. Those doors have all been shut, right? For young people especially, this is, this is going to be a huge trauma, right? But then there's the, the larger question of not being able to access goods that you need to live a decent life, right? We've already seen just in this past week, there have been rushes on sugar and how much of this is kind of worries about uh, goods not being available or not. Um, uh, Russians can return to the way things were during the Cold War. Yes. When you couldn't buy it, get a pair of jeans. Yes. Yeah. Now, I think this is uh, an important <laughs> thing to consider also because it should help us have a more kind of sobered expectation for to what extent can these sanctions work in the way that we in the West might hope they might, right? That they might galvanize the Russian people who know, right, by one means or another that this war is wrong and that they also don't want to be stuck in a pariah state and live in this kind of, um, a kind of society and economy of deprivation. But older Russians have a lived experience of deprivation. Older Russians have time and again, right, in, in still recent history, they've had experiences of ruble collapse, they've had experience of economic collapse, they have historical experience of learning to get by with very little, right? So I think the kind of, the, the, there's several ways in which the sanctions are going to hurt ordinary people, and they are grave, right? not being able to access medicines that people need, not being able to access spare parts to keep cars running, right? But I think we shouldn't be surprised if the sanctions don't bring about what many of us are hoping for, right? A quick and speedy downfall of Putin's regime. Because not only do Russian, Russians of a certain generation have practical experience of dealing with an economy of shortages and deprivation, but authoritarian regimes are also willing to sacrifice their people's well-being. And they can be quite brittle, and they can hang on, right? And Putin has shown that he's willing to sacrifice the Russian economy and his Russian people's well-being for the sake of this larger quest, this larger imperial vision of restoring Russian greatness. Talking about what, what, what Putin is capable of, the war has not been going as well for Russia as they anticipated. It's not going great for the Uni Uni right. Ukrainians either, but it has not been, <clears throat> Russia has not been able to walk in and, and take the country. Um, and if it continues not to go as well, and if the pressure from the West continues to increase, what might Putin do? <sighs> I wish I had a straight answer, right? I wish I had a kind of certain answer. I don't have any certain answers. But I do think that Putin has given us some guidance of what to expect from him, right? I think that Putin has demonstrated that he has an extraordinary appetite, right? He's willing, to, he's willing to gamble, right? He's willing to lay it all on the table, right? He's, he's already sacrificed his economy, right? He's already accepted that Russia has effectively been um, pinned into a corner by the West and made into this pariah state. He has very expressly, in the earliest days of this war, placed on the table, boldly, his nuclear card, right? Russia is a nuclear power. If the West messes with me and interferes on behalf of the Ukrainians, I'm willing to play it. I don't think we should doubt these things, right? I think actually one of our mistakes, right, as observers, as historians, as analysts, in the months and in the years prior to February 24th, the day of this full-scale military invasion, was a failure to take Putin at his word. He's been telling us actually for years, right, and the rhetoric has only become more aggressive and more explicit building up his military. He's not trolling us, right? <laughs> right? He's, willing, he's, he's willing to sacrifice it all, right? He believes he has a special world historic mission and he's taken his shot. But can there be a winner in this? I, I, I think that it is inconceivable to think of anyone walking away from this terrible war with a win, right? I think that there are better scenarios by which this conflict is concluded, right? Ukrainians 
are able to retain their sovereignty. Ukraine remains an independent nation state. One right that also will have their sense of national identity over further emboldened and further cemented by this assault. And that Ukrainians will rebuild and that they will have tangible and meaningful support from the international community. I'm not sure how we get there just yet. But right? th that would be a kind of victory, right? That would be a kind of victory, right? But still, what victory can there be when we've all kind of sat aghast in 2022 and watched a nuclear power transgress every norm of international relations, every norm of diplomacy, and attempted, right, ham-fistedly as it turns out, to put the full scale of his military against an independent state, right? And to bomb indiscriminately civilian targets all across Ukraine. Now, let's say I'm no military expert, right? I, I think that um, as we've seen, right, Putin has failed miserably to get that quick, easy military win that he was hoping for. Um, he has miscalculated uh, by every stretch of the imagination. But let's say his firepower wins out. Right. Let's say he does seize Kiev effectively. Let's say he does, for some period of time, install the puppet government that he wants to install there. That's a Pyrrhic victory, right? What we've, set, what we've seen is Ukrainian people are also willing to give up a great deal for their own sense of nationhood, for their own integrity, right? for their own country. I don't see Putin having achieved, I don't know if he's going to achieve any kind of victory in this, but if he achieves any type of victory, I feel rather certain that it will be a victory of a rather Pyrrhic sort and a short-lived one. Sort of like Assad's victory in, in Syria. Right. The Ukrainian president, Zelensky, has, I think, been an inspiration to the world in recent weeks with this refusal to leave the country and with this defiance of Russia. Has he proven himself to be the right person for this moment? Uh, Volodymyr Zelensky has surprised the world. I think, you know, if he entered into Western imaginations at all, he was like a bit player to one of our own kind of domestic stories, right? The impeachment of a, a recent U.S. president. Um, he has an interesting backstory, right? His backstory was he was an entertainer. He's a performer, right? And Sometimes we're kind of eager to dismiss, right, uh, performers turned politicians, right? Who, who, who is an actor or comedian, right, to tell us how to run a government? But I think actually Zelensky's talents, right, that stem from his career as an entertainer and as a comedian have served Ukraine extraordinarily well in these terribly trying times. He told a Western journalist several years back that he thinks like a producer, right? that domestically, right, long before this, this, this invasion, that he wanted to kind of direct his messages and direct his appeals to the Ukrainian people in a way that they would want to consume it, right? No drying, bore, pre boring press conferences, right? So he was someone already before this invasion began who understood the power of a TikTok video or an Instagram post, right? He understood the power that an individual person's charisma can have. And interestingly enough, he is also said to have studied in his own kind of political rise, um, the meteoric success of one of our own local politicians, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right? And her particular kind of um, very talented use of modern social media. So I think that has been pivotal, pivotal, right? Actually crucial to the degree to which Ukraine has been, especially vis-a-vis -vis the, vis -vis the West, kind of winning the messaging right, and getting people in the West to care, right. In his, ad his recent address to the United States Congress, by all accounts, a room of individuals who rarely find much to agree on, the tenor of the day was that there was not an unmoved um, congressperson in the room when he addressed um, Congress. He has a natural charisma, but he also has some really fine-tuned political instincts. And one of them really intrigues me because I'm a historian. And I think that Zelensky, I've seen this in recent weeks, he really thinks like a historian in the sense that he understands that the fundamental job of a historian is to understand human beings on their own terms. So he uses history when he's uh, addressing the US Congress, when he's addressing the UK Parliament, he uses history to invite foreigners abroad whose help he needs to think about Ukrainians as people just like 
themselves, right? So in his speech to the U.S. Congress, he um, invoked Pearl Harbor, he invoked 9-11, but he also really drove home. Four weeks ago, five weeks ago, Ukrainians had their own Ukrainian dream. It's not too different than the American dream. And they were going about their lives just like you all have been going about your lives. Jobs, cars, kids, pets, mundane concerns. And it all got upended. It all got exploded, right? He uses history and he uses his charisma. He uses his power um, and his mastery of media to garner and to galvanize empathy, which is essential if you need, as the Ukrainians need, all kinds of help from partners abroad, sanctions, weapons, moral support as well. Well, this is certainly a situation I, that has riveted many people uh, around the world. And um, I think a lot of people, they're not only interested in it, but they also want to understand it better. They but not necessarily understand, you know, how it came to this or where it might lead to. And so I appreciate your putting it, answering some of those questions and putting it more in context for us. Thank you so much for having me. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd like to thank Bridget O'Keefe, a professor of history at Brooklyn College and author of The Multi-Ethnic Soviet Union and Its Demise, published by Bloomsbury. To learn about our upcoming shows, you can follow us on Twitter at one to one CUNY TV. For the City University of New York and one to one I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>